already um you won that's it we, we can go home Woo. two days in a row okay the chain rule the chain rule said that if you try to compose two functions and then take the derivative what you need to do is take the derivative of the outer one and evaluate at the inner one and then multiply by the derivative of the inner one. So essentially the derivative of the composition is the product of the derivatives. Well, the derivative of the product is just something completely different. It's a strange world. Uh, so let's do, this program has changed today. Let's do another example um, and then and I'll prove it. So what about the derivative? So sign of root of x. Well, this is a composition of uh, of two functions. First, there's a there, well. First, second, there's a function in the outside, uh, which is sine of u. And I'm plugging in uh, into it. I'm plugging another function, uh, which is the square root of x. So you take x. You take the square root, then you take the sign of the answer, um, and that's the function we gave. So one one way, uh, so this is the same. This is the same as writing that f of x is sine of x. But this probably, if you do it like this. probably um, harder to get confused. So one way to think about this is that we're doing, this is sine of u and u is the square root of x. So the chain rule says, I need to take the derivative of sine applied to u and multiply it by the derivative of u. Applied to x. Um, well. <clears throat> and, well, so when I'm doing this, so here, um, u is the variable. Um, so I could write this as d sine u, du. This is the letter doesn't matter. It could be u, it could be x. Um, uh, here, x is the variable. You could write this as du dx. When you write Leibniz notation, the 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 thing that appears in the quote unquote denominator is the variable you're taking a derivative with respect to. So the derivative of sine is cosine. So here it's cosine of u. The derivative of the square root, um, well, the derivative of the square root I can do by the power rule. It's um, one half x to the negative one half. And I shouldn't I shouldn't leave use in the in my answer at the end because uh, they didn't add me I mean 
if they give me the question in terms of x, I should be answering in terms of x. So this is going to be cosine of root x times 1 over 2 root x. So that's that derivative. Uh, so at the end of the day, you can do everything that I wrote here. You can do it in your head. You can you can go the outside function is, I mean, you can do it in your head, but then it's more likely that you'll make a mistake. Uh, this is the derivative of the outside. The re, but the, And that is applied to the inside. And then we multiply by one over two root x, which is the derivative of the inside. We do not practice, you can do this in your head. And the point of this class is to have enough practice anyway. Okay, are there any questions? Come on, there's gotta be questions. Oh no. <laughs> okay, you gotta understand. I mean, um, Adrian, Adrian thinks you. The thing is, everything seems simple when you see someone doing it. I watch, like, I watch a bunch of cooking videos on YouTube, and then somehow when I, and then, well, Everything looks fantastic. You watch them, you go, wow, this is so easy. And then uh, I like when I try to make bread, it, it either one once it only tasted like yeast somehow. Another time you could kill someone with it. It was it was it was like a rock. Um, you could break your teeth biting it. Uh, the third time, like I would I kept kneading and kneading and never looked like what dough looks when he kneaded when he, um, another time, I clearly didn't have enough salt. It was, it was kind of disgusting. So the moral of the story is you, when you see things being done by someone, it seems very reasonable. Then uh, when you have to do them yourself, whew, uh, then you realize, then, then you struggle, and then you learn. And eventually you go, oh, there you go. That's it. This is, so this is confusing because it involves plugging functions into functions. It's very easy to make mistakes. Um, so does the inside function always stay the same? Like when it says cosine square root of x, like is that ever gonna change? Like is there a situation where that inside function might change when you're multiplying it at the end somehow? No, this part, so this part doesn't change. Uh, if that's what you're referring to. Uh, of course, the second time it appears, so, here it doesn't change because here I'm just supposed to plug in g of x. Um, the second time when I, the the second time it appears, it's there is change because there I took the derivative. Uh, but here it doesn't. No. Okay. So. Um, one thing that you see a lot um, and for good reason is that the chain rule uh, the, in Leibniz notation this looks really interesting um, the word people like um, like to use is suggestive um, suggestive as in thing that tricks you into making mistakes In like, means 
notation. So what does this mean? Say we have um, a function, which is f of g of x. I could say y is f of u and u is g of x. And then I'm trying to find, and then this would be, well, it would be, um, I would say this, I mean, f is y. I would say <clears throat> this is y, y of x. So um, given the, uh, giving a letter to the output of g is generally a good idea to make things make sense. So then when I'm trying to do the derivative of g composed with f, and I get f prime of g times g prime of x, uh, if, I, if I write this in terms of uh, these letters y and u, this is going to be the derivative of y respect to x. This is going to be the derivative of y, but now, well, um, this is f prime of u. So this is the derivative of y respect to u. And um, um, if I call g of x, if I say that this is u, uh, this is the derivative of u respect to x. So the same chain rule that I've been talking about can be written like this. Uh, which, of course, um, looks very looks very tempting to say that the du is canceled. And I mean, they do because this rule works, uh, but they don't because they're not multiplying and dividing. Um, for Leibniz, they were. Leibniz would have told you that these are infinitely uh, small things, magical things that you can multiply and divide, but that doesn't really work. Um, at least not how they were doing it. So um, I wouldn't say that these are fractions, but the thing is, it's good to write them as fraction because they they work like fractions. So I really, Want to oops, say the u canceled, but I can't and won't. <clears throat> okay. Um, but anyway, you see, you see this a lot, especially, you know, if you, if you have like, if you look at a physics problem, they never say, when do you, when do we know to use a chain rule? Like in trig, especially, uh, when you know to use a chain rule, when you, the function you have is a composition, like sometimes there's more than one way to do it, to, to solve your problem. But, um, Basically, whenever you see a composition, you can use a chain rule and it will probably work. Um, so whenever the function is computed by doing some operation and then doing another one, like uh, this example I just did, this is a function that's computed by taking the square root and then taking the sign of that. Um, so, um, Look at a lot of examples and eventually, basically whenever anything is plugged into anything else is when you use the chain rule. So uh, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, in a physics problem in a, in a, or in a math word problem, you never get told there's a function. Uh, you get told there's all these variables you have to guess, and then there's the 
pressure and the volume and the temperature, and they're all related by all these formulas, that means that anything could be a function of anything, probably. Um, for example, if you, you know, you have a gas, you have some pressure, temperature, and what's the other thing, volume? And you could say, I vary the pressure, the temperature changes, or vary the temperature and the volume changes. Anything could be a function of anything. So in the end, you're just, you just have letters that look like, like this. And then you go, well, now I'm going to say that P is a function of V. I'm just solving equations. Or C is a function of P and V. And nobody said, nobody gave you the function. You came up with the function. So um, you see all over physics books, you see things written like this. Um, anyway. Um, learn to recognize Leibniz notation because you will see it. Uh, let's do another example. So now I'm, I'm going to do a different example. Um, Let's do the derivative of a function squared. So this is um, this is something we could do by the product rule, just writing g times g, um, and we we get the same answer. But let's so here we have something plugged into something else. We have g, and then it, to that I do the square. This is the function u squared if I make u equals g of x. So I I don't I wasn't told what g is, so there's just gonna be a, a g in there. Uh, so um, how do I know this? I know this because when I make when I replace u by g of x, I get the original function. of x for u and you get g of x squared. So now the chain rule, if I look uh, down there, it says I'm supposed to do du squared with respect to du and then du dx. Uh, as if they canceled, um, because this is du squared um, dx. So, um, well, the derivative of 2u, uh, of, of u squared is 2u by the chain rule. And the derivative of u is, well, u is g of x. So this is just g prime of x. or dg dx, those mean the same thing. Uh, and if u is g of x, then this means that the derivative is 2g g prime. <clears throat> so I did sine squared yesterday, and uh, it fit this pattern. And any, any function squared fits this pattern. So you could actually, you could come up with a bunch of different rules. Um, invent them, call, call them, put them, put in your name, you know, the rule that says how to compute the derivative of a function that's to the power one half, and then you take the sign of it. Um, so, Any differentiable function. For example, um, the derivative of um, what function do I like? Tangents. Is 2 times tangent, uh, sorry, tangent squared. Ooh. So the derivative of any function squared, now I know it's 2 times the function 
times the derivative of the function. I, I wouldn't memorize that rule if I were you, but you're, you're free to. Um, so, just make g of x equals to a tangent. Uh, so, um, now I just need to remember that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. What am I doing? And, and that's it. All right. Are there any questions? All right. Um, let's prove the chain rule because we can. general okay so remember earlier when i said this seems simple enough i do um that must mean you're doing it by yourself and now you're getting confused is, is a necessary step in learning no way around it okay so um if um, so if I have two functions, if g is differentiable at um, at x and f is differentiable, well, what I need to plug into the derivative is g of x. So, um, So how are we going to get the chain rule? Well, um, the derivative of f applied to g, well, um, I'm going to write our favorite limit. Uh, it's the function where I plug in x plus h minus the same function when I plug in x divided by h. So again, um, g is continuous at x so i can plug in there to the limit is going to be g of x and then f is continuous at g of x so i can plug in there and this is zero divided by zero but um i know that eventually i need to get f prime of g of x um g prime of x i know what i'm supposed to get uh so from this i'm going to be able to guess what I'm supposed to, um, what I'm supposed to do with this, for example, the easier one is um, g prime of x is just that limit. So how am I gonna, how am I gonna get this appearing here? Uh, well, one thing I could do. is um, just make it appear there. How about I go like this? So this is not the conjugate of anything. This is not, um, this is just what makes sense that I would have to multiply by uh, in order to, in order to get the answer I know I'm supposed to get. And now if I rearrange these fractions, uh, 
I have this limit that looks kind of strange. And this limit that doesn't look strange at all. This limit is the derivative of g. But oh, whoa. This limit is the derivative of g. <clears throat> so I just took the fractions and split them in the way that was convenient to me. Um, but this is still the still same formula because I multiply and divide it by the same thing, which amounts to multiplying by one, which amounts to not doing anything to the function. So I'm still, I'm, the limit I'm computing is the same as the one I started with. So, um, so now the second limit. Yeah. So for the second limit, what I need to do to convince myself that I'm getting the correct answer is um, to replace G of X by another letter. So what if I, if I go over here and I replace G of X by U, um, then I'm going to get the limit of f of u, and here there's going to be a u, and here there's going to be something else. Um, so what I'm going to do is what we were doing, how about I do uh, I use this convenient notation. So this is g of x plus some change in x. What I can do is say that this is the this is the change in in g. So the, the G of changing X a little bit is the same as changing U a little bit. So um, this is what I'm gonna put in here. And then, so then what's gonna happen as H approaches zero, what's gonna happen to, uh, to Delta U? Well, um, So by the way, delta u is g of x plus h minus g of x. Um, if h approaches zero, delta u, this is going to be, this is going to approach g of x minus g of x which is zero. So what I should write here is that delta u uh, approaches zero. And now that is the derivative of f. Um, we're in our space, but. The limit, um, the limit of f of u plus something minus f of u divided by something as the something goes to zero, um, that's the derivative. So I'm looking at this now. There's a thing that cancels in the denominator. But this is exactly the derivative. It doesn't doesn't matter what letter you put in there for delta u. It's just a variable. I could call this h. If only I hadn't used it before. Um, f of u. So 
So just call it h. And now, well, this is the derivative of um, of f. Um, So, so what I so what I had in the last page d d x of f of p of x was after doing some work it was the limit of f of u plus h and making u equals g of x minus f of u divided by h times the derivative of g of x. And now I said this is f prime of u times g prime of x. And if I make u equals g prime of x, that's going to be f of g of f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So, um, so that's why the chain rule is true, pretty much. So we were writing, we were writing dx, um, du dx times dx dh. Sorry, no, dy du. Um, and we were saying that some things canceled. And the thing is, they look like they cancel because inside the limit they do cancel. If you if you're careful with your letters, um, so at the end of the day, this is confusing because you're you're moving letters back and forth all the time, um, and you have to have very clear in your head when when the thing is a constant and when it's a variable and you write you write u and x and you have to keep track of which one depends on which otherwise things stop making sense and i think even like you, you look at books and and problems in in a call class and you often see just letters being thrown around without ever saying what is a function of what because we get bored of writing it every, every time but it's very important because you get um because it gets confusing otherwise anyway um i'm not going to ask you to prove the chain rule i just wanted you to know that you can do it if you look back at this um what's much more important is that you know how to use it and you can use it so you can use it for so many things uh so for example what happens what happens if i compose uh instead of two functions, three functions. So I have a number, I do a thing to it, and then I do a thing to the answer, and then I do a thing to the answer. Um, what is the derivative of that? Um, can I use a chain rule for that? What if I want to take the derivative of the sine of the sine of the sine of x? It's probably not a function that we'll, you'll ever see in real life, um, but it's good to know that we can do it. You do see compositions of three functions in your life. So, um, so now, how is this a composition of two functions? What is the inside function and what is the outside function? Wouldn't there be like two insides in this case? Yeah, yeah, there, there would. You're right. But the thing is, I have no chain rule when there's two things in the inside. Uh, so the inside could be sine of sine of x. Which, which oh, uh, uh, so the outside is sine of sine of x. And what is the inside? X. Oh, sine x. Wait, sine x, right. If I plug sine x, actually, 
let's let's just always say the outside function has u. So if I make u equals um, this thing in there, I get back the original function. So um, so what we can do so um, so what we can do is apply a chain rule now. The thing is, I don't know the derivative of sine of sine of of the outside function. I don't know the derivative of sine of sine, but I could find the derivative of sine of sine by using the chain rule because sine of sine is itself a composition of sine and sine. So the 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 um, takeaway is that if you have three functions, what you gotta do is do the chain rule once. Um, another thing I could uh, I could do is just so there's three functions. I could say that the inside is sine of sine. And the outside is sine of u. Again, if I make u equals sine of sine, I'm going to get back the original function. Um, probably making the outside function easier is going to make is going to make me less likely to make a mistake. So I'm going to do that. So if I, so I'm going to say u is sine of sine. Um, so I'm trying to do the derivative of sine of u respect to x. So the suggested version of the chain rule says that I'm supposed to do the derivative of sine applied to u, which is cosine. times the derivative of u. The derivative of u is the derivative of the sine of sine. And I don't know how to do that. Well, I know how to do that. I don't know what the answer is yet. Um, but what I need to do is do the chain rule again. So um, let me just copy this down again. Sine of sine. So this is going to be cosine of u. Times the derivative of sine of sine. So um, so this is where I am. Uh, that cosine of u, I should I should get rid of the u. Shouldn't have u in my answer. So that's going to be cosine of sine of sine of x. So that's the outside, the derivative of the outside applied to the inside. Um, here's g of x, and now what's left is going to be g prime of x. So how am I going to do this? I'm going to do the chain rule. Uh, so maybe, so now there's, well, the outside is, the outside is um, sine, the inside is sine. I'm going to call the inside V because I already used uh, the letter U. And I can definitely call this sine of V is V, uh, v is sine of X. Again, just plug in v for sine of x in there, and you get the original function back. So this is d sine v dv. So the chain rule is definitely the easy part is remembering it because it just looks like a fraction that cancels. So, um, So the beginning looks the same. I'm not doing anything with that. That's done. And now I have the derivative of sine. That's cosine. And the derivative of v, well, that's the derivative of sine. 
be a sign. And I know the derivative of sine, it's cosine. I know the uh, well, V was sine of X. And the derivative of sine is cosine. And that's it. So it wasn't even that bad, in my opinion. Any questions? Um, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, right? Yes. Okay. Good of you to remember because um, very useful. Okay, so here's an example. Um, Here's an example of um, of a derivative that you knew how to do um, before um, before I told you what the chain rule is, um, but you would it would be utterly miserable to do. So the derivative of one plus x squared to the hundredth power. So you're to learn the binomial theorem. So this is, you know, the thing is, this is um, one plus x squared, one plus x squared. A hundred times. So um, you could, you could definitely multiply this out. I mean, not by hand, but there's a formula that tells you what comes out of this. It's called the binomial formula. And it starts with x to the 200 plus, um, then it would be 200 times x to the 198. And the next term would be um, well, it looks like this x to 196 and it would go like that for 101 terms and you could take the derivative using the power rule but it would be uh, really painful uh, we don't want to do that um also um we would have to look up the binomial formula. The terms of the middle would have like a lot of digits. But however, I can do this very easily with the chain rule. If I say that u is one plus x squared, this is the derivative of u to the hundredth power. Um, And I know how to uh, take the derivative of, uh, well, the chain rule says that this is the derivative of u 100 times the derivative of u. So uh, I know how to take the derivative of the 100th power because the base is now a constant. See, the power rule doesn't work. Um, I can't apply the power rule here, at least as, as you know it, um, because the base is not a constant. Um, the base, is, sorry, the base is not x. The exponent is a constant that works, but the base is not x. And unless the base is literally x, it, it's not gonna work. Uh, but here, the base is literally the variable, not x, but now it's u. So I can use the power rule. This is 100 times u to the 99. And now du dx, um, well, I said u was x squared plus 1. So this is another easy derivative. Um, this is 
2x by the power rule. So this is a polynomial. I don't need to think to take derivatives of polynomials. And finally, u, well, I just said uh, u is x squared. So put it back in there. And, and that's it. And I, I mean, I would never think of expanding this, but that, but that is the answer. And we probably don't need to expand this for any reason. So um, uh, the chain rule let us circumvent um, a lot of misery in expanding a hundred a product of a hundred things. And I, you know, this would take me thirty seconds to compute. If I wasn't talking, it would take you 30 seconds, is what I mean. You don't care how much it takes me, you care how much it takes you. Um, okay, so the last example. So how does the power rule actually work when the base is not x? What happens when I take a function and I, I take the nth power? Well, um, so this is not n f of x to the n minus 1. Uh, because uh, the power rule doesn't work because the base is not x. However, if I make u equals f of x, this is the derivative of u to the n. And now the chain rule says that this is du to the n du times du dx. And I can take, I can use the power rule here because now I just have u elevated to a power. Um, and I'm taking the derivative of that respect to u. Notice how I'm taking this derivative. There's no excess in there. If there's excess in there, um, that means I'm doing things wrong. The power rule says uh, that this derivative is u to the x minus 1. And now I have du dx. So this is what the power rule actually works when you when you have anything to the power of a constant. The power the, the exponent still has to be a constant. Um, we'll see how to do it when it's not a constant, but uh, we don't know yet. And the derivative of u, well, this is u is f, so. This is the derivative of f. So this is what the power rule actually is when when you when you have a function in the in the base. So you do the power rule as you would want to, and then you have to multiply by the derivative of f uh, of f. That's what the chain rule tells you to do. Okay, uh, that's it. So now you know how to take every derivative unless it involves logarithms and inverse trig functions. So that's what's next. And then you'll know how to take every derivative that you'll ever see in your life. Um, and you should feel very accomplished for that. So the recording has stopped.